Good morning, good vibes. Welcome back to my channel where we come together to help you enhance your awareness on things that matter and live a more free life. And this is part of a new series I'm calling Human Rights 101. What's up everyone? Happy Tuesday, Isabel here. And today's topic is about something that we confront with every day in our lives, at our jobs, at the grocery stores. It literally follows us everywhere and the more you will know about it, the less it's going to affect you. I asked members of my Facebook group, Diplomacy and Human Rights, what is the one subject you want me to talk more about? And I have heard so many of you, loud and clear, wanting to learn more about this one thing discrimination. This is going to be a very interesting episode and I invited to join me a special guest from the United Kingdom who is going to share the latest theory that brings discrimination to a whole new approach. If you are excited about this topic, please click the like button on this video. It really helps me understand what you want to see more in the future and it helps the channel to continue to grow so that we can help more people to have the freedom to choose how they live, how they express themselves and how they interact with others. So there are more than 1 million employment discrimination complaints filed in the United States since 2010. That's more than 100,000 a year. And although hundreds of thousands of people report job discrimination to the government each year, employers are rarely held accountable. What is troublesome is that only 18% of the time workers receive relief, such as money or, you know, a change in the work conditions. But what do we need to know about discrimination? Well, there are many laws making it illegal to have discrimination at work based on a handful of different characteristics. These laws also differ from state to state. In a nutshell, employment discrimination happens when an employee or job applicant is treated unfavorably because of his own race, skin color, national origin, gender, religion, or age. However, most people do not consider discrimination based on physical appearance or as a term evolved and called between professional, lookism. Well, lookism captures the idea that an individual can be discriminated against based on their physical appearance or physical attractiveness. Many companies are allowed, and there is no federal law against it, to hire based on the looks. You being too skinny, too fat, attractive, unattractive, having a tattoo or not is often taken into consideration when interviewing for your next job. You'll say, Isabel, what? How is this possible? Well, let's take the example of the American chain restaurant, Hooters, that hires based on looks. Not only that you have to be a girl to be hired as a waiter, but you also must be pretty. When faced with discrimination complaints, Hooters argued that being a woman server that looks good, it is essential to the identity of the restaurant chain. In the workplace, the way you look can be more important than the merit of your work to some supervisors. And while co-workers can treat you differently if you don't fit into their idea of professional appearances. There are some good news though. Although discrimination based on attractiveness is not protected by law because attractiveness is not a protected class under anti-discrimination laws, there are some states that make it illegal and well done to them. <laughs> in the District of Columbia, for example, it is a violation of the law to discriminate on the basis of personal appearance. Under the DC Human Rights Act, personal appearance is one of the 20 protected traits for people that live, visit, or work in DC. Yet many states have to come up with their own laws on that. Eliminating beauty bias in its entirety might look like a difficult task, but starting with being aware that it exists and addressing the issue when it comes to you or to those around you is a first good step to your social responsibility. Moving further to a much deeper understanding on the subject of discrimination, I am very excited to bring to you our next guest to talk about the overlap of various social identities that combined can create a new mode and unique of discrimination. 
So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you Alexandra. She's a young advocate and sociologist from one of the world's leading universities, the University of Durham from the United Kingdom. And she took the time over this period to research a very interesting theory about the subject of discrimination, and that is intersectionality. So without further ado, Alexandra, how are you? I'm good, how are you Isabel? I'm very excited to be here to be talking about this new concept. I'm very uh, excited about that as well. Thank you, thank you for taking the time. I know it's uh, kind of late where you are right now here in the US, it's still morning, but thank you for taking the time to speak with uh, our uh, audience here. So let's dig into what is this new uh, theory about intersectionality? How, how, what do we need to know about it? Uh, so this uh, principle was actually pinpointed by Kimberley Crenshaw, a professor of law from the United States, and quote, interconnected nature of social characterizations such as race, class and gender regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage, a theoretical approach based on such a premise. So in other words, intersectionality, Imagine this, if you're visualizing a Venn diagram with three circles, you have three different social traits from one's identity and you have, for example, gender, social class and race. The middle point where all of them intersect, that's the point of um, discrimination that some may face in everyday life. Um, so for example, I can give you a real life example. Um, so scholar Audrey Lord, um, she, you know, she was uh, a woman. I mean, she's a woman um, in the LGBTQ uh, community. Uh, and she was also struggling from a very disadvantaged um, background. So all of those social traits within her identity um, made her, vulnerable in society in such a way that she experienced so many sorts of social traits that put her at risk of discrimination. Um, so I think it's very important to be aware that while some people may face discrimination in, you know, in, in terms of one social trait or one social identity, some may experience it overlapping on overlapping sides. You're correct. You're you're very right. And I know the example of Audrey Lor, who also was an African American woman. So you know there is uh, uh, some cases in not something that um, uh, we don't deal with on a daily basis. You know, you go to the grocery store, you go to school, you go to your place of work. If you are part of a category that identify who uh, beautifully explained through the Venn diagram are part of that that taking the three circle then and, and you have present different social traits like you know you um, are the like a disability person or uh, a different from a race or uh, you have uh, a different you are a man, or a man you know, was talking earlier um, in uh, the episode about the person based on personal appearance and how some companies uh, are allowed to to do that and uh, you, they hire based on how attractive or unattractive you are or if you are a man or a woman so there are also so many jobs out there that um, so far we couldn't see a gender equality in terms of who is able to do that like for example how many women are pilots there you start to see more and more in that even in the parliaments in the, in the world you know you start to see more and more in that uh, women in positions of power so I think intersectionality um, you're right it affects uh, a lot of people nowadays and I think it's a great theory uh, it's a modern theory and uh, why, why should we care about it and what can we do about that now that we are aware that it exists so I think it's very important to be incorporated into the human rights law because in instances, well, especially in court cases, some may argue that, well, well, there's certain discriminations that a person could face, but the court actually doesn't acknowledge for uh, a simultaneity of different discrimination. So, well, I may be um, prone to, I don't know, 
prone to discrimination based on my um, gender. Uh, I may also be prone to having discrimin having experienced discrimination against my race. So those two elements they overlap sometimes in most cases, and the court has to acknowledge that. But in in today's day, that's not actually um, admissible. So I think intersectionality could be a great way to um, in, to be you know like to change the human right the rights law sector and to you know, to acknowledge that everyone is different, culturally diverse, and it shouldn't be a problem. It should be something that we're proud of. Yes, yes, I totally agree with you. And actually, Alexandra and I, we work over uh, the past month here, being in a uh, lockdown. You know, we have better things to do. I'm kidding. Yeah. We, you know, we are just super interested in uh, bringing, and that's why I created this new series, Human Rights. One on one to be able to bring you like the most um, modern topics and to make you aware, so that you, the more educated you are, the the less uh, these uh, laws can impinge on your own freedom. So Alexandra and I, we worked on an article on intersectionality, which is published in the Social Sciences Research Network. I'm going to put the link in the description so that you can download it. You can download it for free and read the abstract. Uh, for those of you who are interested in digging more into this uh, amazing modern subject as alexander was saying uh audrey lord and also kimberly crenshaw who was the the, the uh, promoter of the idea of intersectionality they also believe that uh it's a need in the human rights law for this niche to be catered because honest you know we live in the 21st century why we are still talking about discrimination and not only that we are talking about like basic discrimination against age, gender religion you know national origin we are talking about an evolution of this uh discrim discriminatory uh society so um there there is so much uh, so much more to do in regards to that and study more and raising your level of awareness of, of the subjects that are interested to an everyday person is really what we all should be engaging in. Yeah, you're absolutely right, especially with the help of social media. I think we could all encourage other people to, uh, you know, become aware of such a concept and to be aware of discrimination because so, while some may experience it, they may not be aware that they're actually victims of discrimination. and it might be a joke to some people, but it's a, it's a real issue in today's society. And unless we tackle it now, we won't see a change, a social change. And, you know, like revolutions are made by humans. And unless a human starts it, you know, we can't change something in the human rights law sector. That's that's totally right. And as I like one of my favorite quotes, you know, if you want to uh, change the world, just be the change you want to see in the world that Gandhi said. So I think that really it's applicable in today's society. So thank you so much, Alexandra, for taking the time and sharing a bit of knowledge on the subject of intersectionality. Uh, thank you so much, Alexandra, for being uh, here with us. And I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. I hope so, too. It was lovely speaking to you. I hope you're well and take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. So if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead, please uh, press the like button and make sure you subscribe to this channel because I'm trying to bring every week videos like this one to be able to share with you some of my knowledge and experience. Also, I'm bringing you are able to learn more about the subject of human rights and diplomacy. So go ahead, press the subscribe button and the notification bell so you'll be the first one who knows when I'm posting a new video.